We are recording today's webinar so that we can share it with uh, people who weren't able to attend today. I'll give it just another couple seconds to let some people trickle in. Welcome to our Siri webinar. If you're just joining us, please put in the chat box who you are and where you're joining us from so we can see the wide variety. Okay, let's get started. Hello, my name is Katherine Berenger. I'm Director of Appraisal and Description at the Maryland State Archives, and I'm also co-chair of the COSI Siri Education and Programming Subcommittee. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, which is about real-world experiences and the capstone approach. Before I introduce our speakers, uh, we're going to do something a little different today. Um, if you'll bear with me, I'm going to take this opportunity to have you all answer two short poll questions. Um, we at Siri are always trying to make sure that in planning these webinars, we're covering the topics that interest you. So uh, we do have some questions here for you today. Uh, there's a couple possible topics and we're interested to know how much they interest you. Uh, so please rank them, one being least interested and five being most interested. And then we have another more um, open-ended poll to give you an opportunity to tell us what topics you would like to hear about and what um, speakers you'd like to hear if there were any particular speakers in mind. With these Siri webinars, we hope to come up with the topics and the formats that interest you most. So we do appreciate your feedback and your suggestions. And if any of you are interested in being a speaker yourself, we would be more than happy to talk with you. All right, while we're wrapping up the polls, thank you again for contributing your thoughts. I would like to introduce you to our speakers today. And um, we will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, but please do feel free to type your questions at any time into the chat box. Today we have three speakers. Brian Brown is the Bu Business Systems Analyst Trim Administrator for the City of Portland Archives and Records Center. He has worked there since 2007, and um, he is, works in the Archives and Records Division, which is a part of the City Auditor's Office. He has an MA in Archives and Records Management from University College London, with previous stints at the Oregon State Archives, and a long time ago at the NARA Central Plain Region Kansas City Branch. Elizabeth Perks, is the electronic records archivist at Utah State Archives. Elizabeth has worked for the Utah State Archives for 32 years. She is the electronic records archivist and works with electronic records coming into their holdings. She also manages the archives Axiom database system as well as website harvesting through Archivit. And Maria McCashin is the records advisor for cities, fire districts, and New York City municipal agencies. So now I will hand it off to Brian. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, so just to set a baseline here, we do have the definition of capstone. Um, so I'll just read that here. Uh, and capstone, of course, came out of the uh, out of the National Archives and Records Administration, um, I believe published, uh, they published a white paper in April of 2015, um, and where they laid out their capstone con concept. So reading here, capstone is an appraisal technique in which whole email accounts of people in decision-making positions are captured instead of having users separate their email by content. 
The question then becomes, how do you go about capturing whole email accounts and transferring them to the archives? So we can go to the next slide. So I'm Brian Brown uh, at the city of Portland. Um, I'm going to talk about our capstone effort, which is actually one, I would say, of a failure to fly, so to speak. We didn't quite get there in the end. Uh, and there's several reasons uh, I have developed for that, I think. Um, so this was this is one that didn't quite uh, take off. Um, I must first uh, give some credit to my uh, former colleagues, Max Johnson and Tim Hunt, who spearheaded the effort at the city and uh, who also left excellent uh, documentation that a lot of my my words and thoughts have come from uh, about the the capstone processes, uh, intents, and um, and uh, what was my, and uh, progress. Uh, so with that, uh, let's 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 dive in. Uh, next slide, please. So it's just some city facts in brief. Uh, population of the city is 641,000. There are 2.5 million people in the metro area. City employees total uh, about 8,700, which includes part-time and seasonal. Uh, employees with email accounts is around 7,200. Um, I couldn't quite get a definite number, but I think it's around that. And then a city, our city form of government at the time of our capstone project uh, it was a commission form of government, which means we have four commissioners that are elected and uh, and a mayor. Uh, this this comes into play a little bit when I talk about our uh, difficulties with with our effort. Um, this was voted out in 2022, so it's a it's it's quite a change for Portland, and uh, that uh, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the cast of characters in my my brief tale, Archives and Records Management Division, uh, where I work as a business systems analyst, um, the city attorney's office, and also our uh, city IT. Um, our email environment is uh, Exchange Office 365, I guess now M365. Uh, so that's that's our our uh, technical environment for for uh, email management. Uh, next slide, please. So the capstone beginnings uh, at the city uh, go back to a joint effort uh, between the city attorney's office and archives and records management uh, under something we call the legal records management project. Um, this was convened in 2017 to look for a solution to simplifying email management around the city. Um, many of us uh, as public employees getting fire hosed with email and uh, it was recognized that making individual decisions about every email became uh, uh, very burdensome, bur is, is very burdensome for folks. Um, and so that was, out of that project was the beginnings of, of our efforts. And I, I found a little quote from a, from a document from the LRMP project. Um, included here, I'll, I'll read that. The increasing designation of electronic records as the record copy, as well as the continually growing volume of email that the city is responsible for managing, has made it necessary to explore other email management strategies to improve compliance with state and city record keeping requirements. So we quickly saw after the publication of the NARA white paper um, as um, we quickly saw Capstone as, as worth exploring at the city. Um, so we re-began that, that exploration in, in 2017. Uh, next slide, please. So our approach uh, to Capstone, we branded CORE, uh, C-O-R-E, which stood for capture, organize, retain email. Uh, it makes a nifty visual pun you can see on the right. 
um, getting down to a, a core sample, getting down to the core of things, what we what we need to retain, what can go away. Um, so that that was our our branding for for Capstone was core. This was launched. Um, the project was launched in earnest during two complementary um, Bureau of Streamlining projects. Uh, one was a job classification study being undertaken by our, our uh, Bureau of Human Resources. And the second was our own retention schedule uh, simplification project where we took, um, we had 4,000 schedules, many of them duplicative, and we were able to boil those down to around, I believe, 600 or so. Uh, so these were thing, these two projects were happening while we were engaging in core um, and definitely lent, lent themselves to, to the process. Uh, next slide, please. So our approach to core, we ended up uh, settling on retention periods being uh, four-year, 10-year, and permanent. Um, we looked at, uh, we tried to encompass dynamic triggers with records where you may have a record that is triggered by an event, uh, being a project closed, or uh, perhaps a police separation date, uh, and try to kind of encompass that triggering event into, into the retention period. So ours were slightly longer, I believe, than, than the federal uh, categories. Um, and also we have, we have just two that are um, less than permanent rather than three. Uh, over here, the, the little uh, screenshot there to the right actually shows the work of the records analyst doing some of that mapping uh, from the job uh, classification specs. Um, actually plugging in, you know, this this position should be subject to four year, um, this one to ten year, um, and all of this is with the intent, of course, to provide um, our our best, you know, kind of our our best guess, so to speak, to a bureau for their review before an actual implementation. So this wouldn't be law; this would be something we would take to a bureau before before an implementation of of core uh, to their users. Uh, next slide, please. So we um, developed our pilot and um, realized it should be at least uh, two phases. Uh, so phase one uh, would be just a basic uh, proof of concept against uh, test accounts. Um, that way, we're able to see the behavior of the um, of the Microsoft functionality. Um, we, of course, weren't going to wait around for four years to see if something was going to to operate on that. So we our test accounts were set up, I believe, to two days, four days, and permanent. So we could see, of course, much more uh, real time. Um, you know, if the if the functionality is is working as as we expected. Um, within within exchange. Phase two would be the pilot uh, itself. Uh, there would be 50 users across across bureaus, um, and we would have volunteer and uh, basically would be volunteers who who would who would uh, agree to join the join the effort. Uh, next slide, please. So while we had our um, our proof of concept uh, scheme basically laid out. We developed um, quite a bit of administration documentation for the core uh, project and really going into the functionality of the um, Microsoft uh, tool, which is um, messaging records management at the time. Uh, it's still a mouth mouthful for me, um, but the manual put together by, um, by the records analyst at the time um, really dove into how the uh, the MRM works with default policy tags um, and also retention policy tags, and these are applied to uh, you know um, standard folders in an email account like inbox, um, calendar, and then also um, how that how the how it behaves with user created 
uh, folders. So this documentation um, really lays out how that, that functionality works. Along uh, with that, uh, next, next slide, please. We created um, documentation for our volunteers. Uh, so we had toolkits for both four-year and 10-year folks. Um, that way that they could actually look at the toolkit and understand what would be happening uh, when the core uh, was applied uh, to their email accounts. Um, also a way for them to report on results so we could take those results in and make adjustments, um, understand uh, the behavior of the functionality more. Uh, so this was also a lot of background work uh, that we had done uh, for our pilot. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we submitted our uh, project to IT. Um, here, just a little snapshot of the project intake form. Uh, next slide. So just to summarize where we were, um, we, we had created our um, administration documentation, uh, all the volunteer uh, documentation as well. And we were ready with our surveys to, um, to pull those folks on, on how CORE was working for their, for their email accounts. Our proof of concept project was approved uh, to move forward um, and test accounts created for that proof of concept project. Um, we felt we were, we were ready to go. Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we have some discord and this terrible pun was actually, uh, is actually for, for Gwen. So hopefully she'll, she'll check back in on, and see this because she, uh, she really uh, likes puns a lot. So apologies for the terrible pun here, but we there was definitely uh, discord at this point with the project, uh, beginning with um, phase one. Uh, so there are results on the test accounts where we had some unexpected things happen. We couldn't quite explain why um, some emails were, were retained, uh, even emails that were dated 10 years that should have gone away. Uh, according to a four-year uh, default policy tag stuck around. So we just, we had a lot of questions out of the proof of concept that we couldn't really get definitive answers on. Um, recognizing this um, complexity of the functionality and, and just gaps in understanding, it was decided that phase uh, two should become a separate project due to, due to this. Um, when we submitted it as a separate project, the cost estimate provided by our T folks rose way beyond our budget for, for the entire project, uh, which really pushed it um, beyond our $10,000 we actually had allotted. Um, and some of this budgeting, I will actually, I'll talk about in the next slide, please. So getting to uh, the key sources of difficulty, with that cost estimate for the, for the phase two, it basically caused us to table um, our project. We, as I said, we had $10,000 allocated for it. Uh, the estimate came back as, as more than double that to, to take into phase two. Um, so project was tabled. Why did this occur? Well, there were a number of things I think that happened along the way. Um, one of them is there were some major IT projects uh, that were already in the pipeline uh, that also required the, the individuals that we were working with to actually um, take on the core project. So these the, the same folks, technical experts, were already um, booked for a major project, one of them being uh, data center move. And then a second was um, what we call the Portland building uh, remodel, which resulted in all city employees moving out of um, a large office building and needing to be relocated. Um, so there was a lot of work involved there. That work overlapped with our um, records analyst who had come back on a limited contract um, to do work on course specifically. So he couldn't actually see work into the, into the uh, uh, actual pilot phase. So he had to, his contract was up, unfortunately. Um, 
Other dif another difficulty, there's definite bureau cultural differences. Um, archives and records management division, we provide our services free of charge. We talk to city employees um, to make sure they understand the rules, our processes, uh, the applications we use for, for records management. We don't charge folks for our time. Um, we essentially need to make sure that they have the fullest understanding they need to be able to do their, their work with, uh, with uh, records management. Our IT folks are on a, um, on a billing basis, even for other city bureaus. So we, we essentially hire them to do work, even if the work involves um, a large, you know, if it's multi-bureau and there's a little bit more on this uh, below. Also, there is that we, we found there's a definite learning curve of technology. Uh, specifically, you know, we were in the Exchange Office 365 environment for email. Um, the way the uh, messaging records management functionality worked, um, we didn't have a working a test environment for that. So we couldn't really go in and see the behavior ourselves. We had to ask our IT folks, our Exchange administrators to set things up for us. So we were learning on the way. They also, while being excellent exchange administrators had not really explored this functionality. And so they were also learning on the way. Uh, so that was that was definitely a uh, source of difficulty for us. And then finally, um, the commission form of government. Um, the way that commission form of government works are bureaus being in charge or under the charge of the elected commissioner. Um, and so there's there's some silo effects to that where there isn't a central city administrator or city manager who is able to oversee cross bureau projects. Uh, so um, the commission forum, as I mentioned, was voted out. And we are hoping as the new government forms and a more strong mayor, which is it's still being formed and there's a lot of political around that. Um, we're hoping to maybe revisit our, our core project and, and see with a city manager if we have more success. So with that, that's, um, I hope folks have found that uh, of some interest there. Um, I'll pass it back to you, Catherine. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Next, we'll hear from Elizabeth Parks. Hi, I have a story to tell you guys. It's kind of long about how we've been able to implement Capstone. Um, next slide, please. The first problem with Capstone is convincing everyone that email is a record and that at least some of it needs to be preserved and sent to the archives. This can be a huge cultural change and one that Utah has already gone through. In 1992, there was a law passed called Government Records Access and Management Act, and it defined a record as being business related and um, reproducible and of any physical format. I suspect that many didn't understand some of the implications of that language. In 2001, the legislature invited the archives to participate in a committee meeting to explain to them um, how they could help with electronic records. And the director of the archives at the time was away that day, and so he invited me to substitute for him. So I went to this meeting, and in the course of that meeting, I happened to say that email was a record. Um, apparently only the archives believed that email was a record. Some of the fallout from that particular meeting was that there was a reporter sitting in the back of the room taking notes about all of these things. And a couple of days after the meeting, he unexpectedly arrived in my office wanting an interview. So my supervisor and I sat down with him and he asked some questions. We talked about retention schedules and that our retention schedules were online. He could view them, including the governor's office. And the retention schedules talked about email and correspondence and that some of it was permanent. And a couple of days later, the weekend edition of the paper on the front page of the Sunday paper was an article about how governor wasn't saving his email when he should have been. And I was quoted and um, 
very many, very few people were in that committee meeting where I was attending and speaking. But after the Sunday paper came out with this issue, um, all of Utah and all elected officials and department heads suddenly knew that um, the archives thought email was a record and the governor wasn't following the law. So I heard from a few people that there were some who were not pleased with um, email being considered a record. This was a new idea to a whole lot of people. Well, the media decided to request records from the governor's office to um, gain access to his email, but he had been deleting all of it. And so they filed the lawsuit. And eventually, a couple of years later, the governor reversed course and set in a policy that said, yes, email is a record and that it needs to be kept. Next slide, please. The policy change acknowledging that email was a record did not really change all hearts and minds. There was still tension. Then in 2011, the legislature decided to amend grandma in a way that kind of cut to the heart of transparency and openness. The bill passed and the governor, who was a different governor from 2001, signed it. When the public found out, it caused immediate fury and became issue number one for all media outlets. Protesters took to the streets. Both Republicans and Democrats outside of the legislature were opposed. I remember specifically when the very liberal mayor of Salt Lake City and the very conservative leader of a right-wing lobbyist group stood together and denounced the changes. The governor wanted to meet people halfway, have a new look at the changes and talk about them during legislative interim meetings, but there was too much pressure. Four days later, the governor called a special session of the legislature to repeal what they had just passed. Next slide, please. So the legislature learned something from this experience. The public does actually care about records and record keeping. They want to know what government is up to. Later legislation strengthened the training of records officers so they would know how to properly respond to records requests. An open records portal was created to streamline requests across all governmental entities. Next slide, please. So every day records officers now respond to records requests from the public, including for email. Every public servant knows that their email can be requested. This means that sending email accounts to the archives after someone has left office is just part of the routine process of records management. So we like Capstone. Now in the early days, we had a problem with the email system that we were using and that was actually technically difficult to export data. Um, so we had to come up with a different solution. Next slide. If we fast forward a little bit in 2013, we were contacted by a small town in Southern Utah who could no longer access their email accounts through their normal interface. They had forgotten to pay their internet service provider bill and the ISP sold their domain name out from under them. Their email was held in Gmail, but it was difficult for them to access it directly because their domain name was different than at gmail.com. Their IT guy had a backdoor way to get in, but that wasn't a permanent solution. So they asked us if we could somehow export their data so that they could see it again. Fortunately, the state had just barely migrated all email accounts from Novell GroupWise to Gmail, so we had some existing infrastructure we could adapt for this purpose. We decided to create a tool that could export Gmail, and we used the Gmail API to connect our tool with the small town's email accounts. Next slide. The tool proved to be beneficial for capturing not only the email accounts of the small town, but also other officials in state government. The archives began requesting access to these accounts. Because the tool required me to log in as the person who owned the account, generally we only captured accounts of those who had already left government. The IT department simply reset the person's password then shared it with me. But sometimes others needed data exports and they were still working at their agency. That mean, meant that they had to either share their password with me, which was awkward, or use the tool directly themselves. Eventually two-factor security made it difficult to use that tool for anything other than our own accounts. Fortunately, meanwhile, Google developed an e-discovery tool called Google Vault. One of the problems we found from trying to capture email accounts is that sometimes the user would delete all or most of their content before we could capture it. With Google Vault, it automatically captures and saves everything, even if the user deletes an email. Vault does, does this by policy. Other organizations that use Gmail may have different policies. Next slide, please. When Google Vault became available, we had to work through our IT department to request email by filling out a security form, getting it approved by the agency, 
then working with the technicians to provide the email in the format that we preferred. Often this was a painful and lengthy process. There was even one ticket I remember it took like a year for the IT guys to respond to. Unbelievable. And we were sending in many, many requests to the point that the IT director called me and said it was taking too much of his text time to go chasing after all these email accounts. Besides, he said, it's your job to preserve email. You do it. So he made me an admin for Google Vault, enterprise-wide. There are a couple of state agencies in Utah that do not use Gmail, but do use Outlook. For access to those accounts, we still have to work with the IT folks to get the email as a PST file. But for everything else, we just work with the agency. Next slide. All I need to harvest an email account is a signed transfer form from the agency acknowledging that the archives will be doing the harvest. Note that Google Vault keeps detailed audit trails and knows exactly what my search queries are, whose accounts I have accessed, and what I have downloaded. The transfer form is my permission slip to, work, to log into Vault. When we find out that a director has left, we contact the records officer and remind them about the permanent nature of these records for anyone in a capstone-based role. We even help fill out the transfer form, so all they need to do is sign it. Next slide. When I log into Vault, I typically harvest email, chat, and Google Drive data belonging to the user. I use naming conventions for the exports so that I can distinguish different types of zip files from each other, and I also download all metadata. I didn't know that some metadata was even available until I started using Vault myself. If I had known certain things while the IT department was doing the download, we would have captured different information earlier. Email data comes in inbox format and is usually divided into multiple zip files up to 10 gigabytes each. Since Vault keeps the data for years, we aren't in a hurry if a records officer doesn't sign the form immediately. But generally the transaction time from the moment we know a director has left to the time the email and drive data has been downloaded is just a few days. We now have a lot of email representing 34 state agencies, plus one small town, 105 accounts, and about 3.8 terabytes of data and counting. And we have one outlier of email that's in XML format from when we used to use Groupons. Next slide. A couple of years ago, we had a change of administration in our governor's office. The governor's attorney, records officer, and IT director worked together to help us acquire all of the records from the office. They also signed the transfer form with a spreadsheet of over 300 email accounts that we could harvest and gave me access to shared Google Drives. I am still working my way through those accounts. I have been able to spot check the email to do an initial appraisal. Some were clearly not capstone worthy. Most had good information, even if the person was not in a leadership role. The administrative assistance accounts, for instance, were often used to send email on behalf of the governor or chief of staff and are vital to the preservation of policy decisions. Often these people spanned more than one governor's administration. There were some people who were not included in the list who held important positions as they left several years prior to the change of administration and their email is no longer in the system. This is a problem we will need to figure out how to address. Now that we can see how the governor's office communicated with each other, it becomes apparent where the gaps are. Next slide. So basically in conclusion, for Capstone to work, or at least for it to work for us, um, you may must first have a strong public records law. Your IT department needs to trust you and work with you. Your records officers need to be well-trained and follow retention schedules. And you need a lot of space to store the resulting content. Now our challenge is to try to process all of this content. Okay, next slide. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to share how the New York State Archives used Capstone to manage the email of the State Education Department and to provide guidance on email management to other agencies and local governments. The State Archives is a program unit in the State Education Department. Next slide, please. So some background. Before 2014, the education department used GroupWise email, <clears throat> but that software did not have capabilities to handle email management. The policy that we had under GroupWise was that IT deleted emails after 90 days. 
and staff were encouraged to delete personal and non-record emails and remove any emails that needed to be kept longer than 90 days to another storage system or save them in their GroupWise archive. IT also put holds on emails of users that were part of litigation and staff were responsible for finding information needed for litigation. Next slide. In 2014, the Education Department transitioned over 4,000 email accounts to Office 365, partly because it did have email management capabilities. The State Archive staff worked with Education Department IT staff to implement a strategy using Capstone as a model. And during the transition, IT identified staff involved in litigation, and they converted those emails and archives to Office 365. They also notified all other staff and gave them instructions to copy their group-wise archive to the network, and then IT would migrate those archives to Office 365. IT also migrated all emails four months old and newer, and they rolled out the new system to the entire agency rather than doing it in phases because they felt it would be too confusing to have the agency running two different email systems at the same time. Next slide, please. IT met with heads of agency program units, also known as deputy commissioner's offices, and the state archives, and together they reviewed existing retention schedules, they identified retention categories based on program units, and uh, they determined the longest retention period anticipated for email created by a single unit. Next slide. And so this is what we came up with. The capstone model helped us to apply rules by program unit and to help, helped us determine the longest retention anticipated for email in that unit. So the education department assigned accounts of the commissioners, the deputy and assistant commissioners and council staff, and any position designated executive staff with permanent retention. So if any of those individuals left the organization, their email accounts would be transferred to the state archives. Human resources staff and any staff part of Labor relations disputes were assigned a retention of 10 years after separation of service. And all other staff accounts, including interns and volunteers, were assigned a retention of seven years after separation from service. Staff were also still encouraged to delete personal and non-record emails unless their accounts were part of a litigation hold. And those with non-permanent accounts had to move any emails with a retention period longer than the retention assigned their account to an appropriate filing system. So ideally somewhere electronic, a central location that's backed up regularly. Next slide. To help with email management, some additional retention periods were assigned. So deleted items, such as personal and non-record emails and junk mail were assigned automatic deletion after 14 and 30 days respectively. So this was an auto delete function set up by the system administrator that staff could not change. All other email and calendars were set with an auto archive after 180 days and staff were allowed to make that period shorter or longer. Staff could also delete emails within their archive. And if staff were subject to litigation, a hold was placed on their account. And after litigation was complete, the normal retention was applied. Next slide. HR updates IT regularly on staff with disabled accounts. So these would be staff who left the agency or had a litigation hold placed on their account. And IT would create a list like the one you see that includes the name of the account holder, their program unit within the agency, the retention policy on the account, when it was disabled, 
and also any notes from IT or council. This uh, list like this would be or is distributed to program unit heads, to a representative from HR, and to a representative from the State Archives for review. Next slide, please. Disabled accounts are removed from the system and put in the cloud. And there, authorized staff can search across email accounts. Accounts can be returned to the system if needed. The record copy of an account remains in the cloud. Once the retention period is satisfied, seven to 10 year emails are auto deleted and permanent email accounts are transferred to the state archives. And we did set up a team at the state archives to address the logistics of transferring emails to the state archives, things like preferred format and legal issues. And some of the work that was done by that team is discussed in a recorded webinar available on our website um, called Email Preservation and Transfer. Next slide, please. So the next couple slides after this one, um, I just wanted to show you some of the capabilities of Outlook to apply our account holder rules and to set up some rules that staff could use to manage their inbox. Next slide. So Brian mentioned this. Uh, this is a screenshot from Microsoft's Messaging Records Management Guide. I also find that to be a mouthful. Um, it's available online for anyone to use. And it describes how tags are used to apply retention settings. So Brian mentioned some of this. Default policy tags, these are applied to the email accounts. And they're applied by the system administrator to manage the retention of all untagged items. So ours were permanent seven and 10 years after separation from the agency. The retention policy tags are applied to default folders, again, by the system administrator. So the in, for example, the inbox, we assigned emails to be archived 100, after 180 days and the deleted item folders emails are removed after 14 days. Personal tags, those are the green ones. They can be applied to custom folders and individual items by the email users. So in, in this example, there are four choices, but those periods can be customized by the administrator depending on how much control users want or need. So next slide. This is the second half of the previous screenshot. So it further explains how the messaging records management application operates separately from how users manage their inbox or don't manage their inbox. So users aren't required to file messages in managed folders and any email not tagged will be archived after 180 days and then the default retention policy will be automatically applied to the account. Next slide. This is just another screenshot that shows how different tags can be applied to the mailbox and then the folders, those are the orange tags, and then the individual messages, those are the green tags. And actions are automatically taken on emails based on those tag settings. Next slide, please. And this is just a view of some retention policies that um, were set up that staff can use for their personal tags. So they were set up by the system administrator. The system can add or delete policies. See in the center of the screen, there's a plus and a minus sign. And if you click on the plus, slide, plus sign, next slide, down at the bottom, presents a field and you can add a new policy. Next slide. So the State Archives had a publication on developing a policy for managing email and we updated it to include guidance for managing email based on the capstone approach. It's available on our website and it provides a starting point for state agencies and local governments and it focuses on email management best practices. So things like understanding how email is used by the organization, 
managing email centrally and electronically, setting up a management strategy that ensures cooperation, um, and addressing backlog. It also covers 10 key areas to address in policy, things like understanding the email system capabilities, classifying email, and of course, retention and disposition. The publication includes three sample policies, all using account holder strategies. One is based on the state education department's policy. Another was modeled after a town, a medium-sized town using Outlook. And another um, is, was modeled after a small village using a cooperative email service. And if you have any questions about the State Archives experience with Capstone or our publication, please feel free to email us at recmgmt at nyse.gov. Thank you. Well, thank you to all our speakers. Uh, we're going to open it up now for questions. Feel free to type your questions into the webinar chat. Um, and I just want to thank our speakers again. I think there's um, a, a misconception that uh, people only want to hear webinars about successes, but I think very much we want to hear uh, successes and challenges and everything in between because we can certainly learn from all of them. So I see some questions popping up in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and read them so our recording can capture it. Uh, we have the question, is New York's office, oh, is New York's office 365 license G3 or G5? I, I honestly couldn't tell you. And it's changed since uh, this presentation was created. Um, but I can find out for you, and I'd be happy to let you know if you want to send me an email. Yes, it seems like these things are constantly changing. All right, another question. How are the organizations handling disposition of emails from still active email accounts? Are email just automatically deleted from active email accounts when the retention length is met and no holds have been applied? I can jump in uh, initially. So yeah, our I mean our intent or vision for for core flash capstone was to was to apply to active accounts. Um, once the app, you know, once a user was notified, you know, there would be a certain um, time period, maybe 180 days to allow them to review uh, their accounts for messages that would have already met their their retention period um, and either delete, you know, they can delete, leave them there and let the policy do its work or uh, they would need to do the work of moving them into um you know the proper uh filing place for that for the content of that email if it's related to contracting storing it with contracting records if it's related to policy um so that would our, our vision was to give them time to to work through um before the actual um before things would start rolling off according to the to the retention In Utah, it's my understanding that if users um, delete email from their accounts, it's still kept in Vault, but it depends on their role. So regular email users, um, the email would be kept for about seven years after they leave. And then for director types, it would be kept permanently. But users are encouraged to apply retention schedules, which we have published to their email data. It's a challenging aspect of, you know, records management really only works if it's an ongoing, always happening process. Um, and then it can't just be when the archives comes in at the end. I 
I think um, our speakers today also really highlighted how uh, just different conceptions, like what is a record between different groups of people really plays into this conversation, as well as just the different ways that different uh, agencies work, like the archives as opposed to IT functions. Other questions? If additional ideas have occurred to you of what you want future webinars to cover, uh, feel free to enter that into the chat box as well. We're always looking for topics and speakers. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you again to all three speakers. And thank you, audience, for joining us. Uh, please keep your eye on our website for upcoming Siri webinars. We're also hoping to uh, vary up the format a bit in future webinars uh, to allow for more discussion and kind of an open conversation. Here are the places where you can keep informed of what Siri and COSA in general is up to. And we also have our YouTube channel where we put recordings of the webinars uh, and other educational videos. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. Have a good rest of your day.